for the best group of women. Meanwhile, let me introduce you to Rob. I'm sure many of you already had the opportunity to make this um, very nice, um, yeah, how do you say? Um, acquaintance. Uh, acquaintance, thank you. Uh, Rob came to us from far away Iowa, and I'm very happy that he's here today. He runs the uh, Psychiatrics Genomics Lab, and I'm very much looking forward for him to show us. Um, oh yeah, that's the counter. Um, to show us something on the statistics uh, when analyzing epigenetic data. And yes, there are your slides. Yeah. So I think we are ready. Yeah. All right, so today we're going to talk about approaches for the analysis of epigenetic data. Now, before I start, first of all, I'd love to th first thank my hosts here, Daniela, for inviting me. And of course, I would particularly like to uh, uh, thank professors uh, Meyer and Everly for inviting me as well. And it was six years ago this summer that actually I spent here a month in Constance. Now, the difference between the month and cons uh, now and then is how the field has come. And also, when I came to Constance to analyze actually the first genome-wide, truly genome-wide studies uh, with respect to smoking, the computer I brought came in a small suitcase and actually was detained by German customs. Now, everything we do will actually be done on the laptop. Now, the second thing I would like to do is talk to you a little bit more about it. Whereas I am a part-time professor at the University of Iowa, over the past year and a half, I've transitioned to the commercial side. And I'm actually the C chief executive officer of behavioral diagnostics. It is a small company that is in the uh, area of uh, behavioral diagnostics. And also I'm helping our second speaker here today, which is actually the real treat for you, um, serving as chief medical officer for her fledgling company, Cardio Diagnostics. Now why this is important is because we're in academia. And you always have to know the veracity of what you're saying and the biases. So I own a lot of IP in this area. The company owns a lot of IP in this area. So take anything I say with a grain of salt. Remember is take my word, but trust in replication. Now, today we're going to talk about four distinct points. First of all, we're going to talk about single point analyses. Then we're going to move on to multi-point analyses. Next, we're going to move on to genome-wide analyses building on what Vanya did in his very, very nice talk yesterday. And then finally, move to future directions in integrated analyses. Now, what I would like to point out are two things for you today. Number one is, functionally, there's no difference in single, multipoint, and genome-wide analyses. All of them have the same considerations. The second thing I would like to, to point out to you is, students and postdocs in particular is, we're talking about what was state of the art a couple of years ago. <clears throat> what we'll talk about at the end of this talk uh, is what is going to be the future. And I would like you to particularly in, in take a look at some of the articles we put in the drives for you because that is the future of uh, epigenetics for behavioral um, uh, purposes. Now, when we do epigenetic analyses, every, by the way, I've corrected most of the typos in the slides, so download the latest set here, uh, Model D. So all analyses, whether they be single point, multi-point, or genome-wide analyses, have the same considerations. Now, most of them, in general, all of them offer, operate off general linear models, where Y is a function of X plus a constant. Now, in this particular formulation, X is a diagnostic classification. I would like to refer to the example of smoking because it is readily understandable to everyone in the room. Number two is it comes in both categorical and continuous uh, uh, phenotypes. For instance, we can say categorical, smoker or non-smoker, or we can do cigarettes per day or any of a number of continuous phenotypes. Now, why is simply a measure of methylation? In many circumstances, we're going to look at this as a beta weight, but remember beta weights or percent methylations, if you multiply times 100, roughly speaking, are bounded. They go between 0 and 1. So in many cases, we're going to consider them as a m values. Once again, our error term. And if you do this correctly, in most cases, it is a glorified t-test, okay? Whether it's single point, multi-point, or genome-wide. Now, when we look at this equation and we do our analyses, what we have to consider, and are often not discussed, that were touched upon yesterday are the covariates. In other words, 
age, batch, gender, comorbid uh, behaviors or illnesses, and later today, in this grayed out area, we'll talk about SNP and SNP times environmental interactions. Now, if you do everything correctly, you can ignore most of this functionally. To do this, you must optimize study design, and we'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Now, single point analyses are very easy to understand. And like I said, is I'm actually kind of uh, 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 unique in this room because I can talk about single point, multi-point, and genome-wide analyses because I did it for genetics, and now we're doing it for epigenetics. In other words, I've been around. So the techniques used in, in single point analyses are typically things like qualitative PCR, and it's very commonly done for the serotonin uh, transporter, the corticotropin-releasing hormone, any of a number of candidate genes. Now, newly evolved is digital PCR. Now, what is digital PCR? Now, as opposed to quantitative PCR, where the speed or the cycle, the, the speed of amplification in one tube is compared to a number of reference standards, when done correctly, digital PCR is a reference-free uh, technique that has a lot of advantages. Because number one is, is as a digital technique, it automatically gives us confidence intervals. Now, to accomplish this, there are two machines on the market, and we're scouting to see if there's going to be a third one coming out of Switzerland. Um, now, the, uh, the two machines are a 3D system from uh, Applied Biosystems and the Droplet Digital System from BioRad. Now, this is an example of the smoke signature assay, which quantifies um, smoking, which is actually what we started working on when I was in Professor Meyer's lab many years ago. Now, the, each of the processes and each of any processes work very similarly. All one does is take in a given volume of a PCR solution, in other words, puts a fixed number of copies, anywhere between 20, uh, 10,000 and 40,000 into a fixed volume like 20 microliters. One partitions it either into droplets for a biorad or into discrete wells and then amplifies. And then by seeing if there's one or more blue, one or more yellow, one or more, or one or more of each or none, we do a Poisson calculation and calculate frequency, Bo uh, the, the, uh, the relative methylation in a given solution. It's a very powerful technique and it's coming to hospitals throughout the world. Now, alternatively, st we still do, we use extracted alumina probes. Now, these type of analyses are most commonly conducted for biomarker validation or candidate gene testing. Now, the, when you do this, our goal here is once again to focus on these two terms. To do this, you have to adequately control for confounders. Now, the confounders typically seen in single point analyses are first age and medical covariate matching. In other words, you want to make sure that your cases and controls are a similar age and that you do everything in one or two plates. Okay? Now, the reason for that is typically candidate single point analyses do not have a lot of degrees of freedom, and you don't want to eat them up here. Now, we talked a little bit about batch effects yesterday, and Vanya did a very good job of, of describing that. I am here to tell you is, in single point analyses, these can be quite substantial. Okay? Now, the reason for this is very simple. Okay? The almost every technique that is used today in epigenetics uses some type of preamplification. Now that's okay if methylation is random, but as Vanya pointed out yesterday, actually it is not random, and the likelihood it is allelic. So the likelihood that if one CPG allele is methylated is increases the likelihood that his neighbor is methylated. All right. As a result, when you PCR amplify, because Cs are you know things that have three bonds, Cs and Gs amplify a little bit better than the AT rich or poor, more poorly in the AT rich templates. If you do 60 cycles. If you have more than a couple CPGs in there, you can result in nearly extinction of your methylation signal at the end of an amplification. What is more is, is that in many of the older machines, not the newer generation machines, but if uh, PCR efficiency varies through the plate, okay? So in other words, one side of the plate 
may not amplify as well or actually uh, as the other side. So when you do this, you have to have controls for both batch or for a single plate and within the plate to better constrain your variation with respect to batch. And then finally, we're going to talk about ethnic specific variation. And this is going to turn out to be a huge consideration. Now, yesterday, Vanya pointed out about a very seminal paper in psychiatric genetics and turns out to be in epigenetics. Now, for background here, first of all, these are the two of the nicest people in behavioral genetics. I hope you get to meet them sometime. But more importantly is, is that one has to understand the monomain oxidase A gene. Monomain oxidase A, of course, metabolizes serotonin and dopamine after it's uh, released from the cell. More importantly is a mutation in the monomain oxidase A gene is associated with Brunner syndrome, which is a uh, syndrome found in Dutch families, which is extreme violence, results in extreme violence. Now, so when Afshalon and his group uh, produced a set of findings in 2002 that, that uh, reported that individuals with the low activity allele at monomene oxidase A who were exposed to violence were more likely to be antisocial later on life rocked the field. And this actually was the breakout paper in 2002 in science. Now, the, and more importantly, like any good paper, it actually generated more questions than it answered. Now, very specifically is, is that the number one is it was a boon to those who were interested in the environmental effects on human behavior. Because the mantra from the Human Genome Project was everything was genetics. I'm here to tell you it's not. This was a boon. But more importantly as to epigenetics here is we're looking at maltreatment as adolescents. Something happening at point A result in a change in phenotype at point B. Well, hopefully, hopefully, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, willing, they're not mutating. So their genotype isn't changing, so their biology is changing. Well, to make a long story short, after an argument with probably one of the brightest people I've ever met, my former mentor, Remy Cataray, I lost a series of bets, but it led to the discovery of what are the, the CPG islands surrounding monoamine oxidase A. All right, so for those of you uh, un that haven't memorized all 20, 27 million CPGs in the methylome, this is the structure of the monoamine oxidase A gene. Uh, monoamine oxidase A is rather unique for two reasons. Number one, this is the uh, variable nucleotide repeat region that was first characterized by Sabol and colleagues, I think back in the, gosh, in the 1990s. Uh, consists of repeats of, I think, 22 or something like that base pairs of either two, three, four, five uh, repeats. Now, surrounding it are not one, but two CPG islands. And of course, here is the first exon. In. Now, it is these, the particular, the second island is rather large. But remarkably, what we can see here, and this is actually the methylation Z score of it, what we can see is that for both males and females, Okay, remember males have one X chromosome. Genotype affects the methylation set point of the island. Interesting finding. However, it wasn't until seven, several years later I really began to appreciate the rest of the importance of this, and so did others begin in the field. And very simply, as these are results from genome-wide analyses performed by Dr. Dogan here uh, in, in 2015 uh, with respect to smoking. Now, more importantly is it's smoking in two discrete populations. And I'm sorry, I can't, so there it is, good. So this is in African Americans, and this is in European Americans. And what you'll know is, is that very reliably, CG055 is the top rank marker and reliably distinguishes cases and controls with respect to smoking. But what we see here in the second ranked hit in African, Ameri or in African Americans, but not European Americans, that the uh, GPR15 methylation, which will turn out to be a very important gene later, um, is differentially methylated in African Americans but not European Americans. To make a long story short, the reason for that very simply is, is that in European Americans but not African Americans, there is a polymorphism, a regulatory polymorphism that sits adjacent to the, the, one of the key residues in GPR15, 
that alters the methylation set point. In other words, the local effect on the epigenetic set point determines, uh, regul the regulatory variation determines where the set point and therefore how methylation changes as a function of an exposure to an environmental variable. Now, so once again is that now these sort with ethnicity. So once again is you have to be very uh, cons uh, considerate of what we refer to as ethnic specific variation. So along with gender, you have to make sure that the groups you're looking for have similar ethnicity. Now, and this turns out to be a, not uh, an issue only for GPR-15, but as we'll show, it isn't 80% uh, of the uh, methylome. But if you compare African Americans and uh, European Americans with respect to smoking, the part of the variable portion of the epigenome, roughly 90% of all the loci which are differentially methylated in these two groups are, are affected by genetic variation in one group or another. So ideally, you have to control for ethnicity, and when you can, identify the relative genotype that is driving this. Finally, always, always, always plot your outcomes. Now, this is an example of a successful single point analysis that incorporates each of them, and most importantly, the plotting. So, as you'll see, these are smokers, similarly sized groups, they're matched in age, they're matched roughly in gender and ethnicity. So we're good so far. And more importantly is I personally inspected the charts of each and every one of these individuals and made sure they were relatively uh, medically sound so there weren't anything like uh, congestive heart failure or medication effects we had to worry about. And we're looking at these covariates as well. Now, when you do this, we negate all these terms. These terms are non-significant. They drop out and we just essentially get Y as a function of beta X. In other words, your delta beta, or change in methylation, as a function of an uh, exposure to environmental variable, is about 22% or 0.22. Your delta beta is 0.22. Now, when you plot this, what you see here is that you see more or less a continuous distribution. Why is that important? Well, if you go over to the next SNP, uh, the next CPG over in the array, what you'll find out there is actually a, um, a SNP that alters methylation point, alters the significance, even though there is a very significant change in the overall methylation. But however, when you plot it, you'll see two points. Oops. Now, let's talk about uh, multi-point analyses. The same considerations apply. However, the techniques used differ. Typically, when people do it in official, our initial assays, in, uh, with respect to monoamine oxidase A and uh, the serotonin transporter were done off uh, what they call Maldi-Toff uh, uh, mass spec. Now we call it Epitire, mass array, or its brand names. High throughput sequencing of PCR clones. Pyro sequencing, and pyro sequencing as Vanya described it, actually is if you look in Chris Bach's paper, which is one of the papers from 2016, is one of the reference standards for validating your results of your methylation analyses. Or once again, is you can use multiply extracted uh, probes. Now the advantage here is, is that you don't, you get better coverage, you cover your bases. The disadvantage is it has all the, the complexities of a single locus, and more importantly is batch effects are particularly troublesome. Okay, I can tell you here that I have seen people's results where about 50% of the variance with respect to methylation is contributed by batch variation. And more importantly, as we uh, gave this technique to a comp commercial company out east who will go unnamed, I had to throw away the data. We threw away about $25,000 of the data because the batch variation was so bad. And in fact, in two cases, the blanks were positive. All right? Now, and then of course, we have to do corrections for multiple comparisons. Well, if you think about the, the, C the monoamine oxidase A island, that can be a huge problem. Well. Fortunately, there's a way to cheat. And very simply is the way to cheat is conduct a principal components analysis to see how many truly independent points there are. And what you find with respect to the, the, uh, the, the, this particular area, you find that there are, I think, seven distinct factors with eigenvalues better than one. In other words, you just correct instead of correcting by 
80, can't see that, 86, 87, we just correct by seven. The reference is there in 2010, Steve Beach has used it multiple times. So if you have to do this, this is what you do. Now let's talk about genome-wide analyses because this is the reason we're here for most of you. Alrighty? Now, the key thing here is it's exactly the same except you're doing it more times. For the 450K, you're doing it 485 or about 470,000 times. And now for the Epic Array, you'll just do it about a million times, okay? The same considerations apply. However, the big differences are, number one, you have to correct for background, okay? Particularly for arrays, not for high throughput sequencing, but for arrays. More importantly, there's this more extensive data cleaning. You can't do it manually. You have to have an automated system. You have to normalize your, your background. And for some things, particularly what Dr. Dogan will be talking about today, <clears throat> you're going to need a high performance computing environment. Fortunately, everything we're going to do today can run on your laptop. Okay? Finally, cost. Okay? For a lot of us, uh, QPCRs, you can do it for a buck, you know, two bucks. Okay, the, you're looking at $450, you know, $500 a pop unless Vanya and his group give you a discount, which I'm sure they won't, all right? Now, more importantly is your purpose here is discovery. When you're doing, Q, when you're doing, when you're doing candidate gene or single point, you got a good idea. Here, you're going in a theoretical. And as a result, you got to make a big, huge correction for multiple comparisons. Now, how do we do it? For right now, the legacy data is in the 450K chip, and the new standard is the methylation EPIC array. However, five years from now, we'll all be doing whole bisulfite sequencing, so I would like to turn your thoughts to that in the future. Now, Vanya pointed out a little bit about this today. This bad boy is the new DNA standard, okay? Now, as you described yesterday, there's 850,000 probes on this uh, particular array. Now, the, there's type 1, type 2, as he described yesterday, but more importantly is they map to distinct motifs in the, um, in the, epi, in the methylome. The, a good number of them map to the CPG islands. Now, these tend to be more type 1 probes, all right? And this becomes very important later. Whereas in the shores, which are less dense than the islands, and finally, the shelves, you just kind of think going off into the ocean, um, are even more or less dense. It turns out that, the, it, that most of the variation, which we're going to be look, looking at with respect to the environment, will be, uh, be found in the shelves and in the shores. All righty? Now, a little bit about these two type of probes. Well, there's actually more probes than that on the array. In fact, there are control probes, which help you positive and negative controls, okay, number one. And number two is, in case you screw up and you're, you obsess about this, when we plate, we have a specific procedure. So we don't obsess about whether we got the ID right. But if you look, actually, there's genotyping probes, and actually, for many of the loci, you actually can genotype uh, for it. But they serve as control probes. But by and large, the major probes in the, on the array are type one, which largely type islands, target islands, and type two, which largely ta target the shores. These are going to be, by and large, what you're interested in. Now, the chemistries differ. Now, this is from Pidsley. However, Vanya's article from there very well describes that as all. In fact, I loved it. I dragged one of his next slides in. Now, the difference in the chemistry is as follows. It differs as far as the type of probe and whether there's one bead or two beads. Now, I had a typo on the previous one. But the type, two, type 1 probe is the old style probe and is aimed at the islands. Now, this is a, the probe for CG21253545466 um, and is a very typical probe. Now, if you'll notice, it is aimed at a dinucleotide uh, probe or uh, pair and really comes in two flavors. Number one is it comes in a fully demethylated TG, TG, or CG, CG. In other words, methylated or unmethylated. And that's operating off the hypothesis is either in nature, things are either both demethylated or both demethylated, okay? The second unique thing that you have to look at is that is the, the fact is, is when this probe successfully anneals and extends, it intercalates 
uh, intercalates the same dideoxy uh, dinucleotide, in this case an A. Ready? Now in contrast, we have the type 2 probe. Now these are found on separate loci and use the same diterminator. Here we have a single probe, uh, a probe that binds to a single CPG repeat, in other words, or, uh, or CPG dinucleotide. In other words, a less dense area. And there are some other differences in the probes, and I highly, highly recommend you go through the annotation file and read what you're, you're looking at. But they're 50 base pairs long. This can have four variable um, uh, residues in it, up to four. Now, and in this case, is it anneals not to the next base after the dinucleotide repeat, but it actually uh, looks at either the T or the C after the bisulfite conversion. Alrighty? And in this case, if it is, demethyl if it is uh, demethylated, it binds an A. However, if it is methylated, it binds a G. So the, di di the dideoxy terminators vary. And they're on separate probes. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, this is not Sanger sequencing. Okay? The dideoxys are not fluorescent. Instead, <clears throat> the way we are going to image these particular probes is through um, hybridization to either to a biotin labeled or a DNP labeled probe. The biotin probes, I believe, are always on the cytosine where the DNPs are your, well, put this way, you can see which ones they are right there. Alrighty? Now, the, and <clears throat> I confirmed this with, uh, it's actually not in the literature. They either, um, one probe has Psi 3, the other one has Psi 5, uh, psi five floor. Now, as you'll notice, Psi 3 and Psi 5, the, the, the emission spectrum partially overlaps. That turns out to be very important. Now, no matter how, and we'll cover exactly why that's important, but it, in the end, to a certain extent, as Vanya spoke yesterday, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter. For instance, this is from Illumina, uh, uh, Illumina's um, uh, PDFs, and what they demonstrate is, in the, with respect to the 450K and the EPIC array, the correlations between independent arrays is about 0.8, between 0.98 and 0.99. I've actually independently validated it, and I'm sure you have too. However, a lot of that correlation is driven by the, <coughs> by the uh, differentially methylated regions. You find out all in the particular areas which you're interested in, the shelves tend to be, have much more, shall we say, variance between probes. Now, why are we going to have problems with uh, many of these particular probes? And it has to get down to the chemistries for each of the probes, all right? So, and I want you to understand this, because if you understand this, this is all easy, all righty? Now, as we talked about, the type, the, uh, type 1 uses the, the or excuse me, the uh, type 1 uh, uses two different types of beads. It has the same dye terminator, okay? So how we image these on each of these arrays are these little spheres. And on these spheres, there's 50 base pair oligos, which bind your, your uh, bisulfite converted slightly amplified DNA. Now, if they extend, you get the DNTP, and after Vanya or any uh, genome center you do, um, uh, by, uh, uh, hybridizes the uh, oligo, you'll find out it, by, it binds a fluorescent, okay? Now, in the type one, you have two separate beads and the same floor, okay? Now, the, for here, uh, for the type two, you have a different thing is, both the unmethylated and the methylated probes are found on the same sphere. Now, why is that a problem? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the emission spectrum. So when I probe, this bad boy or that bad boy with the laser and look for the fluorescence. I'm seeing the same colors, the same backgrounds, okay, and the same floor. So the background is going to be very similar for each area. However, here, the, you have a slightly different problem because number one is you're going to have bleed between the channels. Number two is, is that the overall binding load will vary here. Now, why is that important? Well, it turns out Proteins are fluorescent too. They contain uh, phenylalanines, tyrosines, you know, okay? And as a result, 
what happens is, is the background for the type 2 assays is higher than that for the type 1, and we have to account for that in our genome-wide analyses. However, from a mechanistic point of view is, you can put twice as many type 2 uh, assays on an array as you can uh, with type 1, and that turns out to be a very important thing. Now, so as a result, the problem, we have a problem here is, is that as a result of these and other characteristics, the distribution of values for type 1 and type 2 differ, and this is a problem because we're going to do regressions, and we have to have the same variances in them. So there are a couple of solutions. We cannot analyze them together, so we're going to have to do, did I skip a slide here? Yeah, I did. Good. Okay. We're going to have to correct for background, okay? Now, first of all, the, uh, 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 a note of, of, of caution. What I'm going to tell you about is important. You're not going to get published unless you do it, okay? However, Illumina does not state any of these states are, these steps are necessary, all right? And I've analyzed the data both ways and it comes out roughly similar, okay? So the first thing, the, the first thing we have to do when we uh, uh, correct our, uh, when we analyze our data, we have to essentially correct for the greater background, the type two uh, probes, so with respect to samples and across arrays, we simply add the background, the mathematically we add the, back, the background fluorescence of the type 2 probes to the type 1, okay? Now, there are a lot of ways to do it. Vanya described a number of packages. Personally, you know, what I see in the literature is uh, the Dawson, and this is what uh, Misha uh, endorses, so that's what we're going to do, right, Misha? There you go, all right. So, but the... The, the, the bottom line is it simply on a, uh, adds the Dawson method, adds background, and then separately for each type of probe normalizes the between samples, obviously it normalizes the background between samples, and then normalize, and then uh, conducts what's um, normalizes between type one and type two probe types, and then does something what we like to refer to as quantile normalization, okay? Now, what is quantile normalization? It sounds awful, doesn't it? Okay, it really is actually fairly easy, and I'm sure you've done it in the past, okay? So what quantile normalization is, is that, um, particularly for, for people that have done expression, uh, gene expression arrays with one floor, it's easy, all righty? So all you do is I've uh, got two arrays here, okay? With probes A through G, okay? And these are the raw M values for each probe, all righty? Now, so what I do is I take, this is for sample one, sample two. This is a $1,000 experiment, all righty? So all quantile normalization is if I rank the probes, okay, from top to bottom, as far as their mission, or bottom to top, it really doesn't matter which way you go. And then I take the average of each row, okay? And then I replace the individual values of the average, so, for each given value, the bottom becomes 2.5 instead of 2 and 3, and then I reorder the probes A through G. That's all I do for each and every one of the 4 million values on the array. Now, the, the, as a result, between correction for background and for, and if you use the Dawson method, there's a very elegant paper by Pidsley, there's two of them. I urge you to particularly read the 2013. She directly compares the various methods in her sample. And what she finds out that it significantly improves the outcomes. However, it only increases the net yield by 3%. In other words, you get 3% more positives on a genome-wide array. However, the strength here is that unlike with pure beta, uh, the original untransformed beta values, one can very confidently uh, analyze the data using regression. Now, the second problem about genome-wide arrays is you have to do data cleaning. Now, why do you have to data clean? Well, even after transformation of the data, you still have data points which are not valid. Now, Particularly, we're going to do uh, corrections for bead count, and we're going to do for what are called p-values. And then finally, we're going to have to remove bad samples altogether. All righty? Now, why? Why do you have to do this? Well, very simply is, is these chips are actually very little slides like this. 
Okay? And in a, when you look at the type 1 and type 2 probes, if you think back to that uh, photo, by, uh, that illustration by Vanya, is that in addition to the 50 base, pa base pair of ligals, what they have on them is a 22, 23 base pair of ligal, which tells each of those beads where to hybridize in the chip when they're manufactured. Okay? So each bead type of bead type for each type of, uh, for each particular, lo uh, particular polymorphism has distinct locus on that chip. Well, due to manufacturing defects and you do things, you know, a couple million times, you know, sometimes you're not going to get sufficient beads. In other words, you're not going to have enough, you know, target there to, uh, to hybridize against, okay? So as a result, your signal's not going to be valid. There's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. All right. Now, however, p-value is about 0.05. In, in, in so many words, this is because of the, the signal's not above background. In other words, you cannot tell that the methylation signal is above random noise. Generally, this results from several causes, and I recommend that it's generally the crappier samples, quality samples, to give you these. So use only high quality DNA. There are a number of steps that you use. Uh, you use what kind of, we use fluoroscopy. Oh, and the pico, yeah. The Illumina recommends pico green. I assure you, we used to use na nanodrop. Now we actually use fluorometry, a different dye. Uh, fluorometry, before we send them out, they still do both a, um, a pico green, which is an intercalated dye, which looks at double-stranded DNA, not single-stranded, already. And in addition, they actually do, um, the University of Minnesota Genome Center actually uh, does test applications on all samples before they include them. Now, the good news is once you've got this done, you've corrected for a background, you've normalized your data, you're ready to start your genome-wide analyses. Already? Now, today we're going to talk about, uh, talk about two ways to do it. My personal favorite is MethLab. Now, before all of the, this became vogue, actually, the interesting thing is, is that I'm a laboratory scientist. I assure you, if you want to get down and dirty in the lab, I've done it, okay? And I continue to do it, and as Misha can tell you, I still have a bench in the lab, and I still do these everything every day. Now, the interesting thing is, thanks to our packages like MethLab, I was able to do 10, five, or I, I think I'm looking at the data, 10 genome-wides without being a fully trained biostatistician. The bottom line is each and every one of you can do this. This is not hard. We've just talked about the physical basis for this, and these are just glorified single point analyses. Now, the beauty is Meth Lab is rather compact. It'll, lab, it'll run on the laptop. Maybe not your old laptop. Okay? Now, however, it is somewhat limited in the data, size of data set and covariates you can run. This is important because there are certain covariates that you got to run in certain stances. However, today, our laboratory group, particularly Misha, which is why I dragged her here, most analyses are run in, in R, uh, which is the, uh, as is the meth lab, but more importantly is we're running everything in a high performance computing environments, okay? Now, the, the beauty of this is this allows the use of, thing, of bioconductor, bioconductor, as Vanya pointed out, has a number of, of, of packages in it, but each and every one of the, <coughs> the methods that are outlined in Pidsley and in uh, the Journal of Psychiatric Research of Vanya are contained in the biocompactor uh, conductor package of uh, algorithms. More importantly is the high performance computing environment allows for more complex mo uh, modeling and the incorporation of many, many more covariants, including control for cell variation. Now, so very, the, <clears throat> for many years I've been bludgeoned to death by those in the field that uh, uh, need, that talk about uh, needing to correct for cell, uh, for cell type variation. And they're absolutely correct in many circumstances, okay? Now, when we do epigenetic analyses, we use a variety of uh, preparations, okay? For instance, tissue, brain, liver, sometimes these are cells sorted by nuclear or cell, uh, either pre or post, uh, in a number of ways. You can get either, you know, nuclei or cell sorting. Um, saliva. Saliva is very important, uh, popular. And it's important to realize that most of the DNA in saliva actually comes from peripheral white blood cells that have migrated into the parotid and other glands or into the gums 
and migrated into the saliva itself. However, there's also sloughed buccal cells in various states of decay and lots of bacteria. We can do buccal scrapes, okay? And remember, when you do a buccal scrape, you have the slough stuff on top, and you can dig down to nice, fresh cuboidal epithelium, okay? And finally, we have blood, both uh, separated for cell type, either through cell sorting, phycol separation, or whole blood. Now, the problem is, is that cellular heterogeneity can cause problems, okay? Now, you touch your hands and touch your face. You're genetically the same here. The only thing different here is the methylation signatures. So not surprisingly, when you, when you vary the type of uh, cells in your preparation, you've got to control for admixture. Now, there are a number of solutions for it, okay? But far and away, the Houtzman method is the most popular, okay? So there are two ways. He has a reference-based and a reference-free uh, 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 based solution. The reference-based is older. The reference-free is, I think, published in 2015. But essentially, there are regressions that generate factors which are used in covariates and regressions. <sighs> you got to use them when you're doing saliva, all righty? However, it is not necessary for certain applications, particularly for whole blood. Now, we'll talk this in a, in a few seconds, but I would refer you to, there's a paper by Bauer, and also there's a review where we actually discuss people that have actually done it both ways and concluded that for biomarker discovery, okay, you should basically first do it without cell type correction and, and then do it for cell type correction. Now, why? Okay. For instance, the, the GPR-15 uh, um, uh, report that we, we talked about easier, that turns out to be an HIV co-receptor. And more importantly, as you know, we, we, we showed it many years ago, we didn't understand its importance until Bauer from Heil and his group from Heidelberg actually showed that the, that the signal was not a relative increase across the genome, but actually it was an increase in cell type. Bauer has demonstrated if he would have corrected for cell type uh, uh, variation, he would not have seen the signal. Alrighty? However, I always recommend you do it with and without. And quite frankly, you're not going to get published if you don't. The final thing I'd like to talk to is about incorporating genetic variation. Okay? Now, it turns out that uh, the, as we talked about earlier, throughout the, the variable portion of the epigenome, with respect to smoking, it's going to be a little less with respect to alcohol that local genetic variation significantly affects the methylation set points and thereby the change, the, rel the, the relative change, and actually the, well, the values you see in your genome-wide studies. Now, why is this important? Moving along quickly, what we're really interested in is ascertain changes in cellular function as a function of the environment, okay? Now, we can look at this in the, at, the, at the protein level, which is really the most proximate to cell function. We can look at it at RNA level, which is closer to the genome and the epigenome, but it's important to realize that both protein and RNA are each a sum of the effects of genetic and epigenetic regulation. Now, it turns out that if we, can, if we conduct analyses that incorporate both genetic and epigenetic variation into our analyses, we can deconfound the vast majority of the, of the variable epigenome and detect more significant loci. And in particular, I'd like to point out there on your slide is a recently published paper by Misha in which she uses, in a high, um, she incorporates SNP, both SNP main effects and gene time environment interactions. In other words, just like CASB said back in 2002, or at least started this on the journey. And in essence, even though you have to do this, and it was 180 billion calculations, Misha, is that right? Okay, the, as a result, we found 10 times more significant loci than just doing a main effect, uh, lo uh, effect uh, analysis alone. Best yet, you can do this genome-wide, using uh, genome-wide uh, chips, or you can do it with candidate SNPs or on candidate genes. Now, the only thing you have to worry about is, is that when you conduct these analyses, is, the, uh, is differentiating between cis acting variation and trans. And since we do not under, fully understand 
you know, exactly the fold in the human genome yet. Most people use an arbitrary cutoff window of 50,000 base pair or 500,000 base pairs on either side as the window for trans. It greatly increases the number of loci. Now, I assure you it works very well. And in fact, this, is the, this technique is the basis of the founding of Misha's company. This is a abstract in which we're presenting at the American Heart Association. There's a paper under review. And most importantly, is what this shows is for common complex traits that were otherwise unquantifiable, we now can more or less tell you if you've got that. And more importantly is because we understand the genetic and epigenetic variation, we can tell you what medications you should be taking, and we actually can use the change in epigenetic status to guide uh, treatment. Finally, make your own luck, okay? Now the most important thing is use case and control analyses when you do this. When you can, the most important thing you can do, the most important thing you can do is make sure you have reliable phenotypes. So use objective biomarkers, okay? Realize for things like depression, psychiatrists cannot reliably ascertain phenotypes, okay? In other words, when you, the, if you take the data you have today, you'll be given today, change a couple of the phenotype, the affecteds to unaffecteds and the affecteds to unaffecteds, and you'll find out your, your findings just, okay? So, only study phenotypes in which you can reliably diagnose, okay? And I don't recommend subcontracting this to others. If you're putting your career into it, you make sure you read the relevant literature and you see the patients. I'll tell you some stories over beers tonight how I got very badly burned by trusted people, okay? Now, and then pick the tissue that is affected, okay? For instance, for things like heart disease and alcohol and smoking, you know, that comes into the blood. Blood is good, okay? However, blood may not be so good for some brain disorders. So I really like efforts, even though they're very hard. I like people that are trying to incorporate brain methylation assessments. They have a lot of problems, but you know, that's where the biology is at, and that is where we must go for most behavioral disorders. Finally, incorporating SNPs, uh, uh, genetics into your uh, regression analyses increases power. SNPing is cheap compared to uh, the genome-wide analyses. Doesn't cost much more, an extra 20 bucks a sample, and it can mitigate problems from population admixture. Now, today what you're gonna get is actually one of our commercial data sets, a portion of it, just 10,000 probes. The entire data set is actually up on the web. You have the phenotype file for it. You can download the rest. It is present in both. I think we put up the beta values as well as the, the IDAT files, correct? Mm -hmm. I think the beta values, if not, we'll email you the beta values so you can easily, you don't even have to worry about converting them. Okay, this is real data with uh, real confirmed outcomes, okay? There's a tubing group, tubing group that has replicated this twice. Now, more importantly is, is that we're gonna be, in about three months, we'll be sending out a paper that has a meta-analysis. This will be one of the data sets in the, in the meta-analysis already. And what I would encourage you to do is test your wings on genome-wide analyses, download this data, and see if you can replicate what we're doing. And if you can't, call us, because you know sometimes we make errors too. So in summary, we've talked about single, multiple, and genome-wide analyses, all of them have the same considerations. It is absolutely critical to minimize confounders, and always, 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 when you get an outcome, plot the variable. If it doesn't make sense on the single point lo uh, uh, level, I would think about it again before I went and published it, okay? Now, genome-wide analyses, the key steps are background correction, quantile normalization, and cleaning. Avoid these problems by using high-quality DNA samples. You can use your packet of choice. And what I would consider, think about in the future, incorporate genetic variation, and remember, Five years from now, we're not going to be using arrays. We're going to be doing whole bisole phytome sequencing and orient your analytic techniques and your readings to take that into account. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Rob, for this um, very nice repetition of the different methods and also the insight into advantages, disadvantages, and also what one has to pay attention at when one really needs or want to publish something beautiful, which one can trust. Um, we have some some minutes for questions, so if there are some, you can still. Yes. Um, just
just when you're writing, you need to identify small things by manipulation. Hmm? Why do you need to identify small things? Well, put this way is, um, I assure you in the United States, your insurance company wants to know. Okay, I could, give you the, I could show you the commercial pitch deck, okay? But I assure you that the, uh, one of the biggest uh, risk, the biggest, largest uh, preventable risk factor for morbidity and mortality in the world is smoking. No, okay? no, I understand the smoking is that, but why? Well, number one is kids for prevention in children, and number two, monitoring response, and number three is getting people to treatment. What you'll find out is non-smokers, particularly uh, uh, reliably self-report, if you look in the 2017 paper, what you'll find out is people, for instance, that are ill, do not, people in high risk populations, poverty, you know, uh, uh, minorities, do not reliably uh, report smoking. In other words, they lie, basically. Okay, number two is, is that the, particularly when they're ill, they'll misrepresent it. Why fix what's not broken? Go to the source. If smoking is causing your illness, address it. However, in order to treat something, you must have a reliable report. If I'm gonna treat your blood pressure and I don't measure your blood pressure, am I gonna trust your self-report on how your blood pressure is going? Okay. So they, if they don't want to tell the doctor that they smoke, why would they agree to take a test? Be it's like a lie detector. Basically. Because their insurance company is gonna charge them an extra 200 bucks a month. And more importantly, as under incentive-based methods, is actually we'll pay you to quit. So you get feeling better, you save money in cigarettes, and you don't pay so much in insurance costs. It's a win-win-win, isn't it? Now we'll just wait for alcohol and everything else. Okay, so you also have the What's, uh, how important do you think it would be to look at nutrition and how that impacts also the epigenetic? Uh... Okay, that's actually very interesting. If you look, Steve Beach has pointed out a couple papers, okay, that's looked at the relation. In fact, he's, public, he's actually replicated it already. And it addresses the, the great unknown. And the great unknown is not what's in some people's heads, and it turns out to be something, nothing in some cases, but what's in the gut. The great unknown is the gut biome. And what we're showing is, is that things like methyl, methyl uh, group folate availability essentially has a significant effect on genome-wide methylation. Now, we're looking at this because, you know, number one, there's IPL file of this, if this actually can account for some of the variation in biomarker or performance across the genome. But more importantly is, is that what it tells you is the powerful uh, point, uh, role that nutrition as evidenced by folate availability has on the epigenome. After all, what do we give pregnant women so they don't have neural tube defects? Folate. What do we better give alcoholics so we don't get sued? Folate and thiamine, alrighty? So the, you know, quite honestly, the gut biome and the diet are the things, are some of the next frontiers. Okay, just also another one. So uh, there's also something with, I think you, Talk more about the methylation, mm -hmm. uh, but also the enhancers are now quite known to be cell type specific and, and involved in diseases. So, are you going to look anything into that? You mean to, as far as the disease? These regions in the genome that are associated with transcription. Well, you know, the, the, the interesting the thing is, is that when you look at the genome-wide signals for these various illnesses, for both smoking, you have to remember the CG055 is actually in an enhancer. It's not in the, it's not in the exons. The, it turns out that, as we were talking about, and Vanya talked a little bit about yesterday, is, is that the, the, the real interest is not in the CPG islands. It's in the shores and the islands. Enhancer elements, okay? And with respect to common complex diseases, the yeast and human beings have very similar number of genes. Yeast have about 15K, we have about 22K genes, okay? Now the reason we're so much difference in, in between yeast and humans is not due to the number of genes, it is due to their regulation, okay? This, these type two probes are hitting those enhancers which control splicing, gene expression, 
And that is where not only normal development comes, but also disease. Okay, um, one more question. We would have time for one more question. If there's none, um, we will have a coffee break of half an hour now.